within the ecosystem to enable access to health. I'm Usma Chakma, working as a project manager with Selco Foundation. It's been more than five years now that I've been working in the development sector, now about more than a year with Selco Foundation. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sonia Niwomba. I'm currently working as a program coordinator health for Manipur, and it's been uh, one and a half year that I work in Selco. So before we begin today's uh, event, I want to make some a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, we request everybody to keep your phone on silent mode. Thank you. And uh, in your participant kit, you will be finding your notebook, pen, and today's agenda. So as you are all aware, uh, washroom is on your left side, and tea, coffee, and food also will be served on the on your door on the door next side. And and we have kept uh, medical technology and health solutions door behind you. So we we request everybody to busy and engage there. And also, uh, we are making a slight change in today's agenda. The liberation financial station for 2 p.m. will be moved to 12 p.m. now. And the morning station will be reduced by half an hour due to the travel schedules of our esteemed guests and participants. Thank you for your understanding. So, today's first session is on innovations in energy efficient medical technologies for the Northeastern region. I would like to invite our moderator, Dr. Tejasri Balasundaram, to the stage, please. From the dialogues yesterday, we know how critical it is to strengthen and build climate-resilient public health systems. This session seeks to unveil some of the best innovations in MedTech, which are energy efficient, futuristic, addressing unmet public health needs till the last mile. We request speakers to join us on stage as we make the introductions. Can we have on stage Dr. Priyanka Bazaas, Manager Health and Innovation, Impact Lab from PAR. She has a PhD in Microbiology from the University of Delhi with expertise spanning molecular testing, antimicrobial resistance, and public health integration. She advises on the scale up of emerging health technologies at PAR. She also won the Discovery Award 2016 for developing a rapid test for UTI pathogens. We welcome you, Dr. Priyanka. Please give a round of applause. Next, we invite Dr. Niranjan Joshi, who is a program lead, Digital Health and Innovation Development of CCAM. With over 16 years of experience, he has been a key figure in shaping India's bioentrepreneurship landscape. Previously instrumental in establishing the Iraq Regional Entrepreneurship Center at CCAM, he has benefited over 2,000 healthcare startups nationwide. Please welcome Dr. Niranjan Sir. Now I would like to welcome on stage Dr. Sama Kothari, Director Health Social Alpha. Dr. Sama is a seasoned healthcare professional with a diverse background spanning over a decade in various facets of the industry. She has been instrumental in driving impactful healthcare innovation for over 10 years with a focus on improving access, quality and and equity in health services. We welcome you, Dr. Sama Kothari. We also have with us Dr. Dinesh Sangara, who is the Deputy Director Programs of Wish Foundation. Mr. Sangara has over a decade of experience in public health and wellness. Currently based in Delhi, he plays a crucial role in transforming clinics into digitally enabled facilities and scaling up telemedicine services, particularly in rural and underserved areas, contributing significantly to healthcare leadership and program management. With that, over to you, Dr. Petrosky. Good 
Good morning, everyone. Uh, yesterday, we've been discussing about uh, public health, uh, trying to address the unmet public health challenges, connecting the dots from the government, right from the government, the functionaries, the communities themselves. Uh, we've been trying to understand bridging the gaps through technology, through uh, capacity building. Um, we're also looking at um, through value change, building, strengthening the infrastructure, uh, building climate resilient public health systems, uh, right across uh, maternal and child health, uh, non communicable diseases, uh, communicable diseases. Uh, we see quite a lot of challenge in terms of uh, accessibility, affordability, and we're also looking at awareness levels. For last mile, uh, given that there is a concept that is uh, present prevalent in the northeast region as well, uh, we are looking at innovation, technology, uh, uh, medtech innovation for uh, as key solution drivers. Uh, again, uh, maybe the future is about uh, technology and how advanced it is, but uh, if you're not bringing in Strengthening public health infrastructure in these last mile areas, um, I think we still have a long way to go. Uh, I am Dr. Tejasvi uh, Malasundar. I am the program manager uh, for public health uh, from Selva Foundation. We have a wonderful uh, set of panelists here. Uh, we've been working uh, very hard on the technology of the innovation perspective. how we can bring in more solutions which are more energy efficient. Uh, 
So in that portfolio, and specifically for the northeast uh, northeast uh, Indian region, uh, you know, we, we know there are terrain uh, difficult terrain. Sometimes uh, you know, there is excessive rainfall, landslides. So accessibility issues, the, the disease burden is different. Um, so in that sense, and maybe if, there, if the time allows, I'll come to certain examples of work that PATH has done specifically for these kind of conditions and some of our deployments in the region. Uh, but for us, it is understanding first the problem statement uh, and then finding the solutions that fit into that problem statement. Uh, we very recently had something called as uh, you know, uh, how to commercially validate innovative technologies in, that are coming in, in medtech, digital health, innovative logistics. And that's what Yakshama and Devendran were there also and we were discussing like, uh, you, know, you know, sometimes innovations are fitted in a retrospective uh, manner. Uh, our approach is different. We, our focus is public health. And as long as those innovations can benefit the system, are cost effective, uh, you know, saves time and saves life is where our focus is. Thank you, Dr. Priyanka. Uh, my name is Niranjan Doshi. I am representing CCAM, Center for Cellular and Molecular Platforms. We are a Department of Biotechnology Government of India supported initiative. And our mandate is to uh, foster deep science uh, innovations and entrepreneurship uh, for societal impact. This is in the life science domain uh, that we do. Life science, uh, when I use the word, it is broadly uh, used in a sense that it covers health, agriculture and climate. Uh, today we are talking about the health and climate largely. So I just focus on that. So uh, just to answer uh, what Dr. Tejasvi said, how do you uh, essentially uh, identify and look at the <coughs> specific innovations? Um, uh, there are two ways that uh, we go for this. Uh, our mandate is to foster deep science innovations and entrepreneurship. What that means is that we actually really start at the idea level and at that level we look at what is the best that science can offer and where there is a forward integration of the technology, uh, the, what possibilities there. Now this is one, uh, what you can say, it's, a, um, it's one end of the spectrum that we are looking at. By the time it goes from idea, ideation to prototype and then it goes through the funding um, and the acceleration and advancement and by the time it reaches market, um, we have the other end of the spectrum that we look at. And that is where last four to five years, especially from the pandemic, uh, it, we were pushed actually, all, the whole nation was pushed actually to use our uh, innovations and all the efforts that we have put in uh, over the last uh, uh, 10 years or so. Uh, we have supported over 400 innovations in the health, largely in the health, uh, but also in agri and climate. Uh, 400 innovations, how we are going to get it uh, for the benefit of the society. And that's when uh, we uh, came to the point where what is it that uh, we are going to do with our innovations. And that's when we start looking at it from the public health angle as far as health is concerned. And from public health, we start now looking at the, the continuum of care of various specific special specialties as uh, you may call it or uh, sections within the uh, state health department and so on. One section is MNCH and I'm just listing out some of the important segments that we believe are important. Uh, we are talking about the complete continuum of care of within these segments. Uh, maternal, newborn, child health is one of the very, very important segments. Uh, the second segment is the NCD, uh, non-communicable diseases, and there is no more uh, restricted anymore to the urban parts of the India. It is uh, as the 
economic uh, dividends start flowing in, in larger and larger regions, uh, we are looking at them. The third one is the primary healthcare, which is not really a, a specialty based care, but I think uh, I would probably uh, leave it to Wish Foundation to comment upon that. Uh, given their expertise in that. But uh, uh, primary healthcare um, is another set of uh, innovations. I'll probably circle back to which innovations and what is it. But uh, to answer your question, on one end, we ensure that there is good amount of deep science, strong innovations that come in the funnel uh, at the idea stage and accept them. Don't say that, okay, I want MNCH, I want uh, I, uh, I want NCD and so on. Uh, and on the other end, we ensure that we streamline the successful innovations which have reached the complete market and regulatory approval stage in specific streamlined um, uh, directions. So that's our strategy uh, so far. And again, like the innovations and the, like the innovation ecosystem, we all have been evolving. We all uh, actually Paths and CCAM and uh, social alpha, we all work together in uh, one or the other capacity. So there is going to be a good amount of overlap in our discussions. Uh, uh, day before yesterday, we all three were sitting actually in the same room again discussing about uh, the kind of format that she, uh, 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 Dr. Priyanka, spoke about. But I will uh, stop here. I will pass on the mic to Dr. Shama. Um, to add on to some of our um, other as the ecosystem learnings and then uh, to hear about the primary healthcare from British Foundation. Thank you, Narendran. I think Priyanka and Niranjana made my job easier. They just said. So, uh, Social Alpha and Selco have been working together on the Sustain Plus program for a while, uh, which was about key clean energy deployment. And yesterday, sitting in this session, I realized how key that aspect is for everything that we are discussing today. Uh, Social Alpha works with early stage innovations, uh, which have a potential to drive climate action, can create socio-economic equity, and also economic growth for the country. Uh, we work in three sectors, climate, livelihoods, and health. In health, our primary focus is to find innovations that can bridge the uh, deficit of diagnostics and care continuum for remote care for, that can bring care closer to people's homes uh, without compromising quality. Towards this, in the last uh, eight years of our existence, nearly eight, we'll complete this year. Uh, for health alone, we have supported over 40 innovations, uh, 19 of which we have invested in. and. Uh, we plan to invest and look at another 30 in the coming three years. So we want to go and uh, double that number, uh, primarily to achieve uh, an impact that can be measured, which is very difficult in healthcare. Uh, if we can reduce the cost of diagnostic test at the last mile, if we can reduce the turnaround time of that diagnostic, and if we can make it infrastructure free. Uh, so it's great to be sitting at this gathering today to discuss it because this is where it will actually uh, actualize into uh, a reality. Uh, my job is made further easier by what kind of innovations we work with because four of them are here demonstrating their products today. Uh, AI Health Highway, Black Frog, Medprime Tech and Care Mother. The essential part that you see a commonality between these innovations is that they are building tools to shift the task that was earlier belonging to a specialist or a skilled or a trained person. Technology has this beauty. It is very secular and it is a tool to create equitable access. So when you interact with these people, you already identify what kind of uh, uh, change it can have the potential to bring in. And the important part to understand for community deployment is that there is nothing that is in a testing phase goes into community deployment. Community deployment happens when the product is absolutely ready. So it will go through the preclinical trials, regulatory pathway of CDSO, ISO approvals, a, a large scale clinical trial that defines its safety, effectiveness, accuracy, and those results become the benchmark of eventual community deployment. 
So products that uh, are chosen for primary health care then have to go through this journey as a part of incubation process and that is the journey that Social Alpha works with startups. So they come to us at a prototype stage, most of the companies are building their first product. Uh, so for them, this gathering becomes an experience of rich diversity in opinions that can help them build the technology appropriately for different markets. And this interaction is, that's why, very helpful. So thank you for having me here today. Yeah, uh, Shamu, I have a question. Uh, when it comes to uh, prioritizing innovations, um, so can you uh, tell us w uh, how you prioritize and how you go about it? Uh, is it problem, uh, uh, you, know, you just start, with, start from the problem side or you yeah. start from oh, absolutely. the technology? I, I will uh, skip that task because Priyanka and Viranjan mentioned yeah. it. We are a family and we all work on the same principles. So it does not happen without uh, prioritizing what is still a need gap in the ecosystem. Uh, the need gap for private markets is very different from public health markets. Private market might be looking for something that is improving and retaining footfall, is reducing their time of service because they are, their waiting lines are a problem. In public health, waiting line is not a problem. Provision, availability and continuous working of that device is a problem. So the same product will have to be built differently for each market. And that's why the problem statements that we source from are from partners like that would be in ground like Selco, Path, that have the first hand experience of working with uh, communities. We also have a, a partner circle called Community Science Alliance which has over 20 organizations that are working in communities in different regions of India in small or large capacities and they give us their feedback from what is required from their end from public health perspective. But when we talk about innovations, they till the time of clinical trials, they are building a good solution. From that point onwards, they have to adapt or customize or create versions of the product that can go into different markets. Uh, because the price point, the durability, the availability of energy, all of these matters become important and extensively uh, relevant, which they might have not thought about earlier. Uh, thank you, uh, Shama, for that. Uh, my next question is to uh, Dinesh Ji. Uh, the Wish Foundation has been uh, at the forefront when it comes to piloting innovations in uh, public health landscape. Can you tell us about some of the best practices, uh, the process on how you go about piloting the innovation in the last mile areas? Okay, thank you. Good morning, all. Uh, uh, before I uh, answer this, I just give you a brief about the Wish Foundation. So, Wish is acronyms for but one initiatives for sustainable health. Um, our primary aim is to work on a only on a primary health care. So we are very much uh, how we can strengthen primary health care, how we can make a primary health care model is our uh, broader aim. We work with the state governments on uh, uh, various aspects. So if you know about, we are expertise in uh, urban health, digital health, taking uh, challenges uh, on a large minority uh, tribal health, uh, tea gardens. So as of now in India, we are in a uh, eight states, starting from Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, uh, uh, Assam, uh, Meghalaya, uh, and many other states we are working. When we have started in uh, primary health care uh, while managing in an PHCs, we found that it was very difficult because we need to come out with different ideas. So we strongly believe that the technology can bring those things. And uh, we have started providing innovators as a taste bed initially. When I am telling about that 2016. Lots of innovators come and join us and they tried various point of care devices in our, our PFCs. What we found that after some time, there are lots of challenges we come around. Uh, lots of point of care devices, the, their efficacies and efficiencies are not at par. So they, they have not done clinical trials and all. Uh, another thing is what we found that if they have the required standards, let's say they are city uh, CDSOs passed or they have the CE or FDA approved, but how they, how the government can procure those things? 
Lots of problems we found uh, at that level, the innovator don't know what to do. So we have partnered with Bayrek, uh, I think, uh, we have partnered with Bayrek and tried various point of care devices innovation on last mile and particularly doing the feasibility of those innovations and trial that how it's work on the ground, what are the things they need to do, how it will go in the public health system because we only work on a government side, what are their problems, how they can procure. So if I can quote a few of the examples, so initially one of the point of care devices agreed and the government liked that non-invasive uh, uh, hemoglobin uh, device. They really like it can be used by our side, can be used by AM, very easy to use, remotely go on a field. Um, the government liked they put on a PIP. Uh, fortunately, the ROP, Corkart, Sanson, everybody is from the government side, so they understand this. When the ROPs come, so we thought that we won the means the innovators were very happy that now we have the fund and the, uh, it will be procured from the public health system. Suddenly we realized that it's not so easy. When it's come to the state government, there are two committees who are in the, in the procurement, when the technical one is the L1, L2, and L3, the account department and finance department. So that device is, uh, was challenged by the technical committees that it's the only one device is how we can evaluate. There are also discussions going around and finally they say we want to try that device is particularly with the gold standard. They tried that on a, a lab setting and uh, what we found that uh, they have taken a number which is uh, non-scientific, only 23 or 25 they have tried and then they, they come around that is not uh, effective devices. We have means, uh, we have tried to the, take it to the next level, but however, the technical committee was very clear that you do not have a base for scientific base. You do not have STU at that time. So that the point of care devices could not take on the next level. Second thing, if I recall that what we found a uh, difficult solution, so let's uh, lots of point of care devices come out with their own dashboardings and data. Where the, the data will be stored? Who will be use those data? Um, how, which server it will be used? These are very basic questions. So, the majority of the innovators do not know how to do, how to deal with this. Even the government has those challenges because they ask, uh, after this DPDP app, it is more uh, difficult to put where, to, where the data will be there. So till we have those type of uh, from day where the data will be stored because the whatever you collect from that uh, patients, it's all that private data. You can't use that data anywhere. So we face lots of problem initially that where to store. We found found solution, but still uh, there are challenges because still uh, at that time the EVDM was not there. Now fortunately with the help of the ABDM, if the point of care device is or the platform is ABDM compliant and you follow those certain principles and API is available, things can be improved. Uh, third problem, what we found that uh, one-time procurement may be possible. Let's say one of the point of care devices uh, we have tried five years and it's a fantastic result on the ground. And the government like that if the uh, K I means liver function and kidney function stress can be done on a PLC level. The lab, uh, lab, technic, uh, lab technician can do these things on a PLC. Why can't it replicate in all the PLCs? They procured, I means uh, it's a good number they have procured. One time, after one time procurement, how the result will be supplied? What will be the cost? What the, where, from the PLCs, how they will procure those results? These are bigger questions. So one procure, one time procurement may be easy, but how it will be sustained in the market? How it will be sustained with, because one time the government may procure 5 lakhs machine, but after that what happens? So if your uh, supply chain at the last mile is not clear, how your logistics are there, if the government is not aligned with your logistics plans, then it will not go at that level. Uh, there are lots of other things like say innovators need to understand that how the government works. So sometimes they come and they ask that uh, we have made this point of care devices, this is very unique. 
So we say, uh, have you gone through the uh, the government standard? What are the required minimum standards? Fortunately, now the innovators are very aware. But looking to this, we have come out with one paper. You can go in 2018 or 19. We have had. Uh, published one paper from the Wish Foundations. It is in a, a, a publication you go and search. It has clearly given a pathway that on a primary health care settings, if you need to come out with any point of care devices or any solution on a last time for the innovation, if you follow the certain principles, then you can uh, have the, those solutions on at a level. So what I found that if innovators understand uh, what is the government requirement? If they aligned uh, that way, uh, generally, sometimes the uh, innovators are not aligned that because uh, in the government setting, there is more on a program side. If it's the RBSK program, and if you have a solution related to the, that program, and if you can make that solution around that, it's very very easy to sustain for a longer time. Or if your product is a more of an NCD program, if you make that product in a line to the requirement of the government, then it will go a long way. Otherwise, it will not sustain. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that. I think he's saying that uh, uh, tailoring uh, the innovations, uh, addressing the public health uh, challenge, and it needs to be context specific, understanding, keeping in mind the ecosystem requirement. I think that was an important point. Um, so, my next question would be uh, to Dr. Priyanka. Um, okay. So we uh, heard a lot about ONM component for DRE solutions yesterday. We talked a lot about that. Um, could you tell us uh, when it comes to latex uh, interventions, so how does ONM look like? So these are interventions we're planning in the last mile areas. Uh, so what are the challenges that we need to work on and cover? I think there are uh, two, three parts to your question. Uh, I'll cover it from the perspective of what goes into uh, come up with a solution which is easy to maintain downstream post-deployment. Um, what are the components that can be taken care by manufacturers' uh, uh, inputs? And where all a, a, a non-contracted a development sector partner can play a role and then how together these uh, multi-sectoral collaborations along with the government can uh, make for a smoother experience overall uh, on deployment. So the first part to it, uh, which is, uh, you know, pre-deployment, but things can be taken care of. One is, um, we see that uh, a lot of innovators are now very clear on the clinical validation aspect of their device. So they know that they have to test it with a clinical sample, do it as per the regulatory standards, to get a marketing license, and at that stage, uh, when they meet us, they think that they are ready to hit the market. Um, what they are missing out is that, uh, you know, operational trials are equally, uh, and at their kind of stage, sometimes more important than because uh, they've not done the gap assessment in the real world situation. Uh, now this gap assessment could be at the level of the infrastructure, it could be at the level of the skill set which is there on the, say, the healthcare worker that are going to eventually use the device. Um, other conditions like say, their device works very well in, in the clinical validation because it was being tested in a hospital setting where the temperature is around 25 degrees, humidity is controlled, everything is controlled. Uh, but in the okay, field, it would be 40 degrees and 90% humidity. So the uh, device performance can actually change uh, for good or for not so good. Uh, so all of these gap assessment, uh, it's, uh, you know, if that is done and those parameters are addressed in a pilot phase first, is what makes it a better case uh, for scale-up and that's when ONM is better managed downstream. Now, on deployment, um, you know, certain parameters need to be captured uh, for taking that example to, uh, say, another state. Now, what are those kind of parameters? Uh, one is how the device is performing. The other is how that is impacting uh, the uh, operational cost, how that is impacting the overall workflow of the health uh, care worker, which is there. 
uh, is it adding more to it because they're already overburdened in the public health settings or is it making their life easy? We see a lot of apps coming in and all of them say, it's, you know, they need a smartphone. But then there is a capacity to that smartphone. Uh, the healthcare worker, say, we go to the level of an ASHA or a uh, They have a basic smartphone with, say, 64 GB capacity. How many apps can they download and also use that same smartphone for their own personal use? Uh, so factors uh, like these, we conventionally not consider this as operational cost. Uh, we don't consider this as a burden uh, to the already strained public health system, but uh, they do have big implications. Now, when something, uh, you know, when deployment is taking place, how do partners like PATH can play a role in this? Uh, I can probably give an example from Northeast and uh, uh, just day before yesterday, we have uh, done it, uh, introduced a new technology for cervical screening. Uh, it's by a startup company called Periwinkle Technologies, and it's an AI-enabled smart scope. And this has been deployed in five urban primary healthcare centers in Manipur. Uh, now, what we are going to see is because the device is already clinically validated, how this performs uh, in that uh, UPHC environment. And then, then the evidence comes uh, in terms of performance, in terms of the operational uh, consideration, is where we also play a role in the consultative discussions with the government, uh, how this could be brought into a PIP. And that happens broadly at the state level, but then there are components of micro-level budgeting to it. So the solution could be more appropriate for a primary health care center, it could be more appropriate for a secondary or tertiary care center. So it's a consultative process, it's an iterative process, but it requires stakeholders from all these sides. Um, I hope I answered your question. Um, on that note, uh, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Nelson, what is a uh, key camp experience being uh, when it comes to ONM, uh, strengthening the ONM component for medtech innovations in the market? Thanks. I think you uh, put forth a very, I mean, you have brought out very important point of discussion because in the complete uh, discourse of around the innovation, some sometimes uh, the OINM is a very uh, a kind of uh, uh, not so important thing that is kept in the in the. Uh, in the corner and then when you start working that is when it starts uh, uh, pricking you in the in the in the foot so uh, very important part uh, operations and uh, uh, maintenance is something uh, that has been and uh, in that area our work uh, as uh, dr priyanka said is uh, is probably not as extensive as that because we are mostly innovation facing and we are learning it uh, hard way, uh, uh, to be said. Um, uh, she actually said quite correctly that uh, at the design stage you will have to figure out that how it can be uh, a low um, uh, uh, resource requirement. Uh, that reduces a little bit of a burden. Second thing is that the validation at the uh, operational level validation that is required. And uh, during that, uh, what you need to also ensure is that how much amount of, um, um, uh, how much amount of uh, um, uh, commissioning related um, support that is required. Uh, do you have uh, right set of teams? in these different, especially we are talking about the Northeast region, uh, you have to ensure that the right uh, set of people, uh, well-trained people uh, are available in the complete uh, part of the geography and putting team together itself is a, a task by itself, it takes time. But I think it is doable and it is very, very doable. It's just that you need to have the you have to uh, uh, put your um, uh, complete uh, strength behind that. So that is the second thing. A team is very important part. The third thing is that the uh, uh, the chain of um, uh, uh, command building that because at the end of the day, for a startup, 
for a growth stage startup, early revenue stage startup, this is a quite a lot of drain on the resources and most likely it is not foreseen, uh, which essentially means that it is a drain on the resources. Uh, you need to have some amount of um, uh, understanding developed and we are already internalizing that for our next stage of innovations which are early stage. Uh, at the development stage we are trying to uh, ensure that they understand these things and they, these points have to go in the unit economics. Because what happens is that if you have not foreseen it, uh, you are draining on the resources, uh, two things happen. Either you falter and as a result your innovation is discredited or you take the brunt and then your cash flow is really badly straight. Uh, either way, it's not a good situation. You are a lose-lose situation. So I think uh, it's, an, it's an extremely important part uh, which has to be emphasized right from the drawing board uh, to the business uh, uh, planning, uh, to the unit economics and to the team building. It, it spans out complete all across. What is not also very well understood is the importance of training and retraining and the amount of efforts that at least if the startup and the indigenous innovation wants to make it successful, you cannot relegate it to the uh, uh, development partner or any other set of partners. You have to ensure that the right set of people are put in place, it may not be you. You train the trainers and the trainers go and they do that. Because if the training and retraining is not done and you say that it is not my job, uh, which in ideal world situation it probably is correct, but then uh, our state health, uh, public health machinery, if it is not able to do it for various reasons, I am not sure they will do it on purpose, uh, uh, for various reasons, you have to ensure that at least in your growth stage, you take care of that. I think um, uh, there are various other um, uh, uh, extremely important um, experiences that are there in terms of uh, uh, even, I mean, post sales, something that goes from uh, post sales to the um, uh, O and M. I think that part is also equally important, but right now I am uh, stopping myself here. I'll pass this on to Dr. Sharma as well and if there is any other set of things or any other questions you have. I'll come back to Dr. Sharma in a while. Uh, my next question is to uh, Dinesh Ji. Uh, you told us about um, innovations and how you, uh, what are the ecosystem enablers for piloting and innovation. Uh, I wanted to understand um, what, um, how do you, I mean one, you have uh, piloted and innovation, how do you push it to scale uh, with the government? So, generally, the route for the PIP ROP is the best. And fortunately, now the government has come out with the government uh, e-market. So, GM portal things are very improved because the bigger challenge always come around that uh, uh, a single, uh, single procurement what to do where we find the uh, uh, other solution. So the government has come around this uh, uh, JAM portal, which is an excellent uh, platform where uh, uh, any government can procure. But the bigger questions come around that uh, which uh, part of care device is to be selected or uh, on a longer term, how it will be uh, used for a long term. A uh, AM &E or a medical officer having, let's say, five to six point of care devices, they have a different infrastructure, they have different calibrations, they have a different uh, data points, they have different things. Now as a government, what I found that if we can come around with a, a smart solution in a way that is capture everything together. Or at the last, I think uh, we need to make uh, some conditionality to the, all the innovators or we need to define the RF in a way that that data must be uh, means available as per the government norms. Or the region should follow the particular pathway. Otherwise what happened that generally let's say 
a medical officer, if you have, uh, if let's say government has procured uh, one lakh uh, um, cervical, some, some screening device on the ground, they have reached to the ground, the ANM is using. If she face the problem, where to she will go? If she needs some help, what to do? If the uh, data is a challenge because she is maintaining lots of data, if she needs to capture the data, it is going to some other level. So there are some ground level challenges are there, which need to be addressed from day one when, before we procuring any product. So I strongly feel that uh, we need to come out with a solution which is, has provided a comprehensive solution. To add further, I think the procurement is more at a state level. Though we have a JAS and DHS, but at that level the procurement is not uh, possible or there are our norms are not so flexible. As I am a medical officer, I like this particular device. Can I procure my way? As of now, it's not possible. Can they go jam? Means the procurement process are very complex. As a district collector thing, so district collector being the IS officer, they take this. I have seen that uh, uh, district officers they have tried few pilots and they are scared. I can give a few examples where the at district level they have procured and the state had learned from that district, okay, this is fantastic, let's put in the PIP. But at a last mile, can AM procure? Can the medical officers can be procure? Those systems as of now is not available. So I strongly feel that our processes for uh, uh, financing and this three, uh, uh, three quotation and all those things, though the jam is available. It's not going on the last map. Uh, if I add one more thing, what uh, Priyanka Pring, uh, said that on the last mile, the feasibility, uh, we can say innovator can work. I see what devices which are in your marketplace as well. What they have done that when they were uh, they were thinking that idea, they come to our PLC and they have started discussing with the staff nurse. That product they conceptualized that. We have run the nine month trial with them. Till nine month, we have I think more than uh, three times FGD with the, all the staff members who are using that platform. And they have provided lots of inputs. The inputs like uh, how the battery should be, or these devices both bari hai, AM comments, uh, the pregnant women can't carry. All those things they have incorporated in those uh, devices and that improvisation now it is very easy because they know the ground challenges. Just to add one more thing, it's a, lots of point of care devices uh, I prepare in a very standard setting. They don't know what is going around on the ground. We have used one point of care device, I don't want to name that. But in Rajasthan the degree is 50 degree. So that device after 35 degrees says that uh, it can't work. So <laughs> we have procured a good device, the government is watching us and it's like, okay, what to do? So sometimes it's very challenging that uh, the real setting, so it's very much important that when the government even procure, in RFP that certain standard must be carried out that uh, we, this is our conditionality, it must work on this, otherwise we will not procure or we need to take those uh, devices back. So, uh, the technical committee and financial committee need to be clearly explain all these criteria from day one, so that uh, uh, who the innovators can apply or not apply, can be, uh, they understand the criteria as well. working in an academic lab or a maker's chamber uh, where they are trying to build a solution for a problem that they have seen in one or a few settings. It is not necessarily the representation of the problem across 
every possible setting in India. Mm -hmm. A country as diverse in geography, population and cultures as India. So they come up with version 1. But that version 1 has the promise of a change which will be positive and empowering to our uh, resource deficit uh, public health system and also resource deficit private health system. Uh, there is a very standard set process now with government and has become mainstream like Priyanka has said about regulatory certifications, clinical trial, license for manufacturing. But all of this is not necessarily uh, an incentive to build top quality. They are basic minimum. Uh, you have a chance here that, or a choice for the entrepreneur here is what do they want to build. Do they want to build something that is going to be acceptable or no, something that is going to be really high quality? This route defines the resource and team planning that they will have to do. More often than not, uh, for the first product, they will choose something that is basic minimum. And that is also fine. Because we have to understand that uh, there are two types of applications that we see in healthcare settings. One is for screening and the other could be for a more definitive diagnostic. Uh, the kind of people using these devices will be different. The nature of use case of these devices will be different. Uh, so also the acceptability of their sensitivity, specificity and device criteria for each of these applications will be different. If a treatment decision is going to be affected, then the clinician wants to know whether to prescribe or not. But if you are trying to do a population epidemiology screening, and trying to identify what is the disease burden in the population, you want something that will just say risk or no risk. Uh, when you help the innovators identify that, and that is a part of our work, uh, the journey to commercialization and market becomes different. So they will still go the clinical trial, they will still get the license to manufacture, but during that time, they also interact with people who are going to be their potential customers. So your customer discovery starts parallel to clinical trials. Those customers will define the use case settings, the pre valid price point that they would pay for it, and eventually de decide the total addressable market. The journey is different for diagnostic uh, decision tools, which happen more in the case of uh, people where you have a trigger alert for uh, somebody having an uh, onset of cardiac failure, uh, uh, people on renal dialysis who need uh, immediate intervention, and infection control for people who are immunocompromised. There you don't have a chance to take uh, more time to decide. Your test has to be near perfect because that will determine whether the patient travels, the, com the family travels with them to the center and uh, get admission and medical intervention on priority. Uh, so there you have to go beyond the minimum required. Your clinical trials have to be absolutely uh, watertight and being tested in stringent parameters followed by a real world setting. Now uh, for both these devices, Real world setting is a whole new plethora of problems because till now, like we discussed earlier, they are in a controlled setting, clinicians are managing, people are on spot to fix everything if anything goes wrong. For innovators to deploy in real world settings who have a small portfolio or their first product is extremely difficult and that's where I think there is strength in collaboration. Uh, because these are working as small teams, the electronics, mechanics and robotics and now biotechnology work behind every product is nearly the same. So the ONM maintenance can be shared. Uh, what is equally important is for us where we are preparing them for TRL7 uh, onwards to go into real world settings is to get the operational pilots like Priyanka mentioned. Uh, what happens is most of the innovators go individually through their network to do this. If we have something like a rolling program that says that, you know, every year you're going to have this chance, it becomes a calendarized and a anchor point for startups to look forward to that, yes, that place will give me at least 50% of my answers. To the line what even Mr. Dinesh was mentioning. Because uh, for innovators, again, you have to imagine them in four or five people team. Uh, not, they can, can't be present at more than two places at a time. So if one congregation gives them those answers, uh, it's an extremely valuable resource. And that's what even we, had, we have struggled with. Uh, different innovations require different kind of people, but it necessarily the setting remains the same. It's a PLC, 
it has your clinician and your paramedical staff and your maintenance staff. What input do they have for the innovation is the part that we are still trying to fix. And beyond that, then they are ready to go to market. Then comes in your pricing, your distribution and supply chain, which is a whole different game, but yes. So we, our exit point for our startups, we think is when they have sold to their first 100 customers and identified their next thousand. That's the point where social alpha hands over the battle. You made an important distinction about the precision, the level of precision based on the context. So I think um, that was uh, uh, important. Uh, now I open the uh, panel to the audience. Uh, any questions? And in the meantime, uh, uh, I request uh, the panelists to give one uh, uh, closing comment, one insight to the innovators here on uh, how uh, one message that they need to institutionalize uh, when they come up with innovation for public health and last mile areas in the north east. Questions? Hello, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Kiran. I am a DNO MPCC HIS uh, Manipur. Uh, my question is, uh, as uh, many of the panelists have uh, said, like uh, introductions of the many energy efficient technologies and the point of care devices. There are pros and cons for all these devices, as we all know, and there are some efficacy issues. And I would like to cite one example. Uh, we also have used uh, some uh, point of care devices in the state of Manipur. Many of these used for uh, outreach session and health camps. And there, what happened is that the, some of the findings are uh, very earnest, and we could exactly identify it. As long as the doctors are there nearby, we can cross-check the patient. But if it is used by some ANMs or uh, some uh, usually uh, by free CXOs or something, they could not cross-check the patients. So it's like at a certain time, what the patient have to is like suppose they are not having any problem, and the uh, instrument has diagnosed something that you are having this problem. So it's like instead of the helping the uh, patients, you are creating some more, you know, like stress. Like suppose if they, if the device diagnosed that like you are having heart block, then you are supposed to rush to the tertiary hospital. So when they go there and they diagnose that you don't have it. So is there any, uh, you know, uh, process of the certifications or the clinical trial which is uh, like very strict? Because all these devices, I think, it comes to the market under uh, if they pass through all this, uh, you know, process of certification. So, is there anything that can, uh, you know, restrict the overflow of the such devices in the market? So, uh, there is. Uh, depending on what kind of license the uh, product has been applied for, if it's a screening tool or if it's a diagnostic tool, CDSU doesn't have, in my best knowledge, requirement of how much is the precision level. However, before deployment, that's why the operational trials, depending on who's using the device, the device is supposed to give out a prompt. So, uh, if it is not the clinician, it won't really give you what is the problem or the exact reading. If your ANM only needs to know whether to refer or not, that's the only point that they will prompt on it. That's how they have to be built. Uh, but is it necessary that every device that comes to you has that sensitivity of uh, healthcare communication established already? No. That's where they probably will need your guidance as to who will be using the device in the field setting because they have built it from a clinical perspective uh, without having an understanding of how many different types of people can be using it. See, the beauty of healthcare innovations is actually it's decoupling service from knowledge. The knowledge is tied in that device. How much of it is to be uh, actually released to the user can be contained in the device. But it can create an advantage of time of reference and a time of just keeping monitoring. So uh, sometimes you may, uh, the ECG might come out negative. Uh, so, sorry, uh, it might throw up an error that it looks abnormal. But that 
moment, the health worker has an opportunity to relate whether there was a stress test, what was the person running, is there a circumstantial uh, situation because of which it might it's throwing that uh, evidence. So they can say let's monitor and come back tomorrow. So that sensitivity, the device alone should never be used as the uh, chief decider of care ahead. And it has to be built with the community and uh, the deployment organization and the innovator together to build an interface that suits the user requirement. That's what I would say. Any other questions? Quickly add to that. I think a uh, uh, very pertinent question. Uh, we have to accept to the fact, and I am answering from the medtech developer's point of view. Right? There are many points of views here. Uh, from the medtech developer's point of view, there will be a um, non-zero uh, kind of uh, possibility of not having the correct results. And that is something that is enshrined within the regulatory framework where the risk is associated with the, uh, with the class of the device. So uh, that is one part and we have to accept that part. And it, it's always the, the, the both sides of the coin come together. What is important here, as Dr. Shama mentioned, is that what is the standard operating procedure? So there is a device, it tells you screening uh, a result. But after the screening result is given, what is the standard operating procedure? And that is something on the service side is has to be clarified. And uh, truth be said, the only when that clarity is there, only then that device needs to be procured. Now, whose onus on whose I mean whose responsibility is to ensure that this happens? Uh, I presume it happens on the uh, health procurer's side uh, because once the device is cleared and uh, cleared the regulatory approval, it has the marketing license. That's the law of the line. Now, whether somebody wants to buy it or not is for the uh, is for the procurer to decide. You can as well say, well, great, your device is regulatory approved, but I don't want to buy it because I don't know how to deal with it. Um, usually in the real world situa situation, SOP is developed and only when there is a clarity on the SOP uh, and when the risks are all mitigated, uh, only then the procurement happens. Hi, uh, morning. I'm Dr. Satish, uh, founder of a medtech startup. Uh, I think a medical devices company goes through three uh, validation: the technology, clinical, and regulatory. Uh, but some of the on-ground challenges which we face, like despite having the CDSU approval, for example, uh, uh, I think the panelist mentioned about the gem portal. There's a lot of duplication, right? Like once uh, these are again national government bodies which have already certified. Been close to one year we are struggling to list on gem portal right there's a lot of information asymmetry uh, duplication of work uh, for startups and this is taken advantage by the touts or agents or, or uh, so-called consultants uh, right uh, so i think uh, all four institutes work uh, with the government very closely uh, and then there is sandbox uh, environment uh, is there any effort done to kind of uh, streamline and make things easy for startups if you can uh, throw some light on that. Uh, I don't know. Uh, the point of care device is when it is procured, it's a single party procurement. That's very difficult. If you go any state government, district government, they will not procure a product. So JAM provides that opportunity. So I strongly feel that I understand the pro the processes are long because you need to apply. Then it's a, a you have a CDSO. Uh, once you have that, and uh, maybe it will uh, resolve in some time, or the government will take care of this because the BIREC and other bodies are strongly working on the this uh, guidelines a lot. 
But I see as an opportunity because uh, you have a platform now. You can go to the state government and say I am registered in Jam. You can procure from there. Otherwise, you don't means we don't have that opportunity as well. So I see as a, I am optimistic and I think that this is a way means this is at least a solution where we can procure things for the government. You know, if, if I could also add to that, and it's a very valid point. There's no. Uh, Two ways about it, um, and for you know, for paths we've not been very much into the gem uh, side of it, but for certain other uh, you know things like uh, ABDM integration or e Sanjeevni integration, we have worked very closely with the government, and because our programs have been enabling the providers to uh, you know, be more uh, more and more providers integrate into those platforms is where we also get the opportunity to help the innovators also connect. And in the past, we've had uh, extended that support to several startups in easing out their point of connect with the right people they should be speaking with. Also, if there is any tweaking or revision required before they qualify to be integrated into such platforms is where we have supported them. but. Having said that, I think because we eventually are system integrators, if GEM is some uh, point of pain uh, which needs more uh, you know, direct connect with the right stakeholders is something that we can maybe put up and have a larger discussion where people in from the innovator side and from the government side could come and they interact directly rather than having it through an indirect route. Uh, yeah, I would like to add here that uh, it's also about um, not all towards in them, but you know, it, it, it would work better if you think that if all um, uh, the platform allows for integration into the existing system, we can move on. Excuse me. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, so I think with that, we'll close the, uh, uh, okay, that will be the last question. Good morning everybody, my name is Uttam Bhattacharya, I'm based out of Guwahati and <coughs> keep a very kind look on the Northeastern territory as a whole. My, uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody present here, especially uh, you know, the organizations, Wish Foundation, SICAM and others who are here, for all the excellent work done in Northeast to help the needy and to improve the health care, health care, you know, the facilities. But my uh, basic request to you, it's not a question, the so request is that we've been, uh, we've seen the deployment of beautiful devices to do with, uh, you know, child care, mother and child, to do with, uh, you know, non-communicable diseases, to do with mother, you know, I mean, uh, pregnant women, uh, the fetal stuff. But the only problem is that uh, please ensure and just see that you can tell the innovators that the consumables which are required after deployment is something which the government is going to take a serious look at, in, if not now, in the next few years to come. Primarily because uh, you know, I am very heavily involved with CCAP, to be very, very frank. I work for them, I am a consultant for the Northeast, and we've done tremendously well here. But the thing is that the consumables is something which the innovators and the developers, whom you, uh, you know, put through stringent tests before we put them to the public, I think should be advised uh, to come out with Reasonably priced consumables. A device which is costing one lakh seventy two thousand, uh, it may go on for life. But then the consumables may be about five thousand rupees a month. You have blood analyzers, you have uh, equipments which can give three hundred sixty five watt tests. You don't need internet. You don't need air conditioned room. But then you find that the reagents to be used is about a lakh and a half, and that also depends on the footfalls. If there are more footfalls, it can go up to about two and a half, three lakhs. Now, who's going to pay for all that? As it is, Dinesh has said a very, very, very sort of, you know, uh, practical thing. That you go level one, level two, you cross, and you hit a dead wall in level three. Why? Because some committee comes in, some tender committee comes in, some evaluation, you know, then technical, financial. So these, uh, you know, to do with the government, uh, one has to have uh, the, you know, the, you know, the pulse that the government is uh, trying to move at. And probably if you keep tandem and, you know, remove parallax, we should be able to do it. But then again, the garments are all, uh, you know, not so surplus financially. They eventually look for CSR donors. Even then, uh, you find it a little difficult for the red carpet, well, not to be given to us. 
Well, we have to go through that big mud hole and you know, uh, our souls get, uh, you know, and we're buying new shoes uh, while we can walk in the corridors. But this consumables, this is something which is going to fall back on every one of us in a few years to come. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, dear speaker. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Only one comment, okay. Uh, if that is the case, I think it would be work on the user experience. Uh, if you want to be sustained for a longer duration, not just uh, fizzle out after a pilot. And your users are uh, the user of the device, the healthcare worker, your users are also the beneficiaries, your user is also the government for the public health section. Uh, so uh, it doesn't end after deployment, it's the complete cycle right from a customer support service which is functional to, uh, you know, if the device is not performing as well, how do you troubleshoot it uh, and not just uh, get away with the responsibility. And, and think of it as a complete cycle right from product development. So it's designed for the end user, we call it human-centered design, um, and it takes into consideration uh, all of the factors that uh, will eventually help better adoption. Thanks. I think a uh, few points uh, will be coming. I mean, as we go across uh, the, the panel, I think, uh, please consider this as a cumulative uh, uh, kind of uh, um, uh, last parting uh, kind of uh, uh, messages rather than each individual speaker's message. A uh, few points Dr. Priyanka has mentioned. I will be very quick. Number one, be very realistic about unit economics. Stick to your, stand your ground because it may be difficult to defend in the early stages but you, later on you will realize that as a business you have you will survive if your unit economics you get it right and in, if that includes all the things as dr Penga again mentioned the complete life cycle and not just uh, hitting the uh, i mean start the early revenues uh, increasing price later on is extremely difficult it uh, dents the credibility it just becomes a messy business later so that's number one number two uh, think about the capacity building, uh, both from your startups uh, post-service uh, support, as well as from the uh, uh, training uh, and retraining, as well as the early adoption support. I think uh, you can't just leave it to the buyer, at least during the first few uh, days of your uh, revenue generation cycle. Thank you. Uh, so everybody sitting here and all of us discussing today our eventual outpost there, the goal is to work for the community. Uh, everybody comes in with different strengths and that's why I would leave everybody with the message of importance of collaboration, engagement as early as possible, as much as possible and always build a scenario for shared success. That's how eventually sustainability can be achieved. For quality, primary healthcare technology is a way forward. Let's think comprehensively. Think uh, from user to the customer perspective both the way. I think if we think comprehensively, we can find the way. Thanks. Uh, my last point, the innovators would be uh, to actually uh, ensure that the innovations are actually addressing an unmet public health challenge and um, it is energy efficient, uh, the innovation being futuristic and it also facilitates decentralized healthcare delivery um, so the public health system itself becomes climate resilient for these areas. Thank you. With that, I request a huge round of applause for the for these fantastic speakers. Thank you, dear speaker. We have a token of a uh, small appreciation from our side. Can you have one?
Thank you so much for your time. Uh, now uh, we will break for tea for 20 minutes. So I request everybody to come back within that 20 minutes. Tea will be served on your uh, on the door next to you. Please.